And I want to point out particular for selecting me to, to chat on this panel. And I won't go along with uh, introductory remarks because we all know that the fun and the meat um, in these discussions generally comes from our Q&A. Um, I would say that generally, if left to legislators on a voluntary basis, you never sit on the far right because you know you're going to have to go first. But here we go. Um, you know, I think it's no secret for me personally, one of the, one of the things that I've focused on in the legislature is trying to kind of uh, start up and breathe life into a new sector of our economy in West Virginia. And by that, I'm speaking chiefly to the, to the entrepreneurship and innovation community that we have in West Virginia. And, and there is a community there. It exists. I've had many discussions. Many of the folks in this room uh, touch and concern those very industries. But it's time for West Virginia to shine a light on the brilliance that so many of our small businesses and our innovators and our entrepreneurs in West Virginia have. And uh, I think this legislation, uh, in particular with my discussions with not only Secretary Gaunch, but uh, his leadership team with Mike Graney and others, we've, we've really focused on some key tech proposals that's going to hopefully put West Virginia on par with many of our surrounding areas. Um, I think we always say that uh, in West Virginia, uh, we don't want to uh, uh, be left behind. And I think in the tech and entrepreneurship space, we're lagging a little bit behind. But the good news is, when you talk about tech and you talk about entrepreneurship, it's a quick pickup and it's a quick catch up. And it's easy, low hanging fruit and singles and doubles that we can hit in West Virginia. And I'm excited to do that. Uh, a few weeks ago, I established alongside uh, Sean Fluharty, a bipartisan tech caucus in, in the legislature. This is not limited to the House of Delegates. It also is inclusive of the Senate. And I can tell you, if the tech caucus had been started five years ago, we wouldn't have been having uh, broadband issues this morning. So um, we're going to really focus on the issues that, uh, that many young West Virginians are excited about. And, uh, and, that's, and that has a lot to do with tech. So we're excited about some of the events that we're going to put on throughout uh, the session to educate uh, members on um, these technological growth opportunities that uh, people are doing in other states and some other innovative ideas that we can do here in West Virginia. So those are just a few kind of initial thoughts that I have, and I'll pass the, pass the floor. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, thank you, Don. Glad to be here this morning. It's a good forum. Uh, uh, I've participated before, not in this capacity, but... Uh, I love being here. Um, it seems like this year, the, the year just kind of, bam, came upon its end, and all of a sudden we're approaching the legislative session. Um, and I'm excited about it. Uh, I will tell you, uh, I, I suppose I'm here this morning, and probably what we'll talk about the most is the Western Development Office. But Commerce consists of nine agencies. Uh, I always forget some of them, but... In addition to West Virginia Development Office, there's West Virginia Division of Forestry, Geologic and Economic Survey, the, the Division of Labor, Office of Miners Health, Safety and Training, uh, the DNR, Rehabilitation Services, Workforce West Virginia and Tourism, nine very dynamic agencies. So when I'm thinking about legislation and how it's going to impact us, I always think about all of those agencies. Uh, I'm excited uh, this year for some of the initiatives that I'm hearing about coming from the legislature and from the governor's office uh, and anxious to answer any questions you might have. I'm Senator Eric Tarr and uh, thank you as well to the Press Association for having us here this morning. Uh, um, it's honored to get to come up and, and talk about economic development. In the legislature, pretty much everything we do touches economic development. It's, it's not necessarily just an island to itself. Uh, you guys have an agenda spread out through the day. We're talking about foster care and taxes and budget and all that is also touches and affects economic development. So when we come up here for our 60 days and then all the, the time spent between, just about everything, the discussion that you'll hear within the legislature comes back to jobs and how the individual's personal independence, their self-reliance, and their prosperity is affected by the legislation that we're considering. And so whether it's um, to dealing with foster care, whether it's dealing with opioids, whether it's dealing with roads, or specific things about things that get in the way of an entrepreneur in West Virginia and how can we move those obstacles, those are all economic development. 
And so uh, I don't think that we're going to find one silver bullet, but we've got a lot of silver buckshot um, to, to throw at it from about every committee we're going to be in. And so uh, I look forward to your questions, and uh, thank you for having me. Well, thank you very much for having us, and Happy New Year to everyone, and welcome uh, back to our next legislative session. This is kind of always the, the precursor to what's come. And thank you for what you do, because without you and without the press, and without the media, all the work that we do, good, bad, or indifferent, would go unnoticed to the people of West Virginia and across the nation. So thank you for what you do. Um, I'll be brief and, and just talk about, you know, we, we did a lot last session in focusing on the, uh, the larger corporations and tax incentives and, and, and attracting businesses here, and I think we need to we need to shift our focus this year and what you're going to see a lot from uh, members of my of my party is focus on West Virginia companies that are that are currently here and especially like what Delegate Moore Capito said the small businesses who are really the backbone of West Virginia those employers who they're technically classified as 50 employees or less but I'm even saying down to 10 employees or less what can we do to help those small businesses because I really do think you know you go after a lot of those grand slams and those home runs and not but we go after those singles and those doubles and get those people here that are here currently invest and how can we help them grow but also it comes from a marketing issue and that's where you all help from a marketing issue and what our state has and does and the secretary and his department has done a fantastic job of helping spread the word across the country and across the nation and across the world about what we have here in West Virginia but I also think just like senator said economic development touches every committee up here whether it's the Judiciary Committee, whether it's the Education Committee, especially the Education Committee. What can we do to change the way we talk about education so those high school juniors, seniors, even sophomores, from the time they step foot as a ninth grader, what can we do to help them get ready to be prepared for the jobs that we have here that we can't fill? So they're not wasting their time in high school on maybe curriculum and, and, and extracurricular activities that aren't getting them to fill the spots that we have available. It needs to start, it needs to start immediately, it needs to start from ninth grade on to develop and see what those students what they like, what they don't like, what we can do to help them be successful to meet the jobs of tomorrow. And then lastly, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to what can we do as a state, anything we can do to partner with these, bring these new companies here, but we also, number one, need to hold them accountable. And I think we need to hold them accountable. We give them a tax incentive, we need to follow up with them, we need to make sure they're doing what they say they're gonna do. Are they creating the jobs that they said they were gonna create? Are they fixing the, helping fix the sidewalks? Are they putting the, they making their, their property look uh, uh, presentable? We need to hold them more accountable if we're giving them an incentive to come to our state. Thank you for having us. I guess I'll start. Um, start with something pretty easy that Senator Tarr, you mentioned. You mentioned that the state doesn't have a single silver bullet, but a lot of buckshot, a lot of silver buckshot. Does that... Does that mean that the state still doesn't have a firm idea of what it wants to do in terms of economic development, or is it more we need to try multiple things? No, I didn't say that at all. I think that the challenges for economic development in West Virginia touch a lot of different places. And so you, you can't really hit that with one bullet, what I was saying, or one topic. Because even if you're looking at, let's talk about something that you wouldn't necessarily consider economic development might be foster care. Well, being able to care for those that, are the, that need us the most and that have that safety net requires a strong economy, right? And so if you're going to attract somebody to live in an area, uh, a business that's going to bring a CEO, bring their staff, there's things that they're going to look at. One's going to be quality of life, right? So how are we, how are we improving that quality of life for every West Virginian? That matters. How we are show ourselves out, as, uh, as Delegate Scaff said, to the world matters. And so there's a lot of different things. I, no, I'm not saying at all that we don't have a plan. I say the plan's actually fairly large because it touches every committee in multiple aspects. Um, there's some, a lot of the singles and doubles that the, they have mentioned, I think that's where your buckshot is. I guess probably we kind of said the same thing and saying it a different way. Um, I think going just the grand slams help the singles and doubles come behind them. Um, and grand slams to me are when we bring in the large investments. If you have the petrochemical industry that comes in and actually gets diversification, that helps all the small business side of it, which I think is something over 85% of our businesses in West Virginia employ under 20 people. And so they have to have people to serve. So the big stuff matters when you talk about if you're going to take a big swing, a big shot. But in order to get there, they look at all the other stuff that we do. And so we have to pay attention to small things. 
I'm, I'm going to follow up with uh, what um, Delegate Moore and, and Senator Tarr have been talking about here. Primarily related to the quality of life that you just mentioned and um, uh, Delegate Moore talking about uh, speaking to our innovators, entrepreneurs in the state, uh, that we don't want to be left behind, you said, and you want to address issues that young Virginians are excited about. Given the population decline in the state where a lot of younger members of, young educated members of our state are leaving for careers and for lifestyle changes, is it time for the state to pass a non-discrimination act? Okay, sure, thank you for the question. And I think it's tremendously important, and I'll double down on what I said of the, the efforts that we need to make to attract. You know, I, we, we always use this phrase, we want to attract young people, and we do want to attract young people, but we also want to retain uh, our young people, but we want to retain our old people. We want to retain everybody. We want to attract everybody. But as, you know, as nature would have it, we all grow, we all age. And so we need to start looking towards the future and just, and I'm going to address your specific question. But, uh, you know, the previous question was, what is, you know, we've got, do we have a lot of silver buckshot or a silver bullet? And I think in West Virginia for too long, we've focused on, you know, as Wayne Gretzky always said, you know, you, you can't skate to where the puck is. You've got to skate to where the puck's going to be. And so in West Virginia, we need to start approaching the way that we want West Virginia to look like with that mentality. Where is the puck going to be? Because what we do this year, if we're playing catch up, that's old news next year. Someone's moving on. And, uh, and certainly um, there is no place in West Virginia, there's no place in the United States of America, no place in this world where we should accept discrimination. Um, I think that that, uh, you know, that uh, there's been several pieces of legislation that have addressed that. I know that discussions have gone on on very high levels from uh, your all's reporting. Uh, and uh, I know that it's gone, you know, all the way through the ranks. So I think that uh, certainly that's something that will be a topic for discussion this year. Um, I can't predict, you know, certainly I can't predict the outcome of that. But my personal view is that there is no place for discrimination in the state of West Virginia. Or anywhere, quite frankly. So you would support legislation for, for protecting um, the civil rights of LGBTQ community? It all depends on what the legislation particularly says, but yes. Okay. I'm going to be on the other side of that. I would not support that legislation. And here's why. One of the things that I said was about over 85% of small businesses in West Virginia employ under 20 people. Right, so you're talking about somebody whose livelihood is around their business. And what we're doing with legislation that creates a class with around sexual identity or sexual preference creates a cause of action against those business owners that is almost impossible to defend, straight or gay. So if you're somebody who comes to apply to one a business, um, and having been in business for 20 years now, uh, there certainly are people that fish for lawsuits and there's lawyers that fish for lawsuits. This is one of those things that all, an attorney, all they have to do is have somebody claim that there was discrimination based on a person's sexual identity or sexual preference. And there's really no way to discount that because what happens is, is the employer who has an employer practice liability insurance that protects against any kind of discrimination or sexual harassment, those type things in the, in the workplace. When you have that insurance, the insurance then tells the business owner that we're going to pick your attorney and we're going to decide whether you actually t fight this thing all the way or you settle. So when this goes in, so you have somebody who would make such a claim, they take that claim and they go to an attorney and the small business owners then going to get a letter from the attorney. They want to know who your insurance is and they want to know who your lawyer is. And then the first thing that insurance is going to do is they're going to turn around and say, we need to settle because it's going to cost more to win this because of how difficult this is to prove one way or the other on either side of the coin than it is just to settle. So what happens is you get a trial attorney who gets a quick fifteen, twenty thousand dollar check for sending a letter. This bill is dangerous and I would oppose it. 
So there are several cities in the state that already have non-discrimination ordinances. Are you speaking from their experiences about what they've faced in court, or is this just all hypothetical? No, I wouldn't say it's hypothetical. I would say that I've um, uh, been... Do you know of any cases in any of these cities? Not necessarily against sexual preference or identity specifically, because I haven't followed those, to be honest with you. What I would say is, is that when there is a low-hanging low fruit where it's going to be a lot more expensive to go through and prove a case rather than to win it, rather than to just settle, it creates a frequency, a higher frequency of cause of action that's, that's taken advantage of, and all it does is serve to fill pockets off of insurance companies. Thank you, Senator. Senator, oh, you got to yeah, if, I, if I could just add a second, sure. I mean, you know, we do, we do so much to attract large corporations here and companies here, and there's like a checklist of things that they go through to, to pick states that they want to relocate to. And believe it or not, this is one of those things. And if we don't do it, it's 2020, everybody. I can't believe we're still talking about this. It's actually embarrassing that we don't have a non-discrimination act on the books already. There are companies currently in West Virginia who as part of their company policy, they have a non-discrimination act, and they call me monthly and say, when are you guys going to pass something up there so I can send it up to corporate? We're one of the few states that don't have something on the books. If you're saying anything that deters people and saying we're not open for business to everyone, this is one of those things that I think truly would deter a company from choosing here. Thank you. Uh, Senator Tower, you talked about taking big swings. Uh, I travel a lot, and everywhere I go in this country, I see ads on local television as well as cable channels for the from the state of New York saying, move your business to the state of New York, and we will give you forbearance on your property taxes for the first 10 years you're here. And I think the philosophy is they're going to make up the revenue with sales tax, income tax, and other things. Uh, and I ask this to all of you, in particular Secretary Gaunch, why aren't we doing something as big and bold as New York? They're attracting a lot of businesses. They have a lot of business already. What about forgiving property taxes for 10 years to bring a company in here or multiple companies? Well, uh, generally speaking, Mark, uh, I mean, it's a great question. We're doing similar things in tourism. Legislature gave us another $14 million last year. And if you're in uh, now in Chicago and New York City and Boston and Charlotte and Atlanta uh, and Nashville, you're seeing ads for West Virginia tourism, uh, similar to what you're talking about. Um, but frankly, we don't have the dollars to, to make that ad buy you're talking about in terms of economic development. We just don't have those dollars. Um, and and, the, and another truth is, uh, New York's kind of desperate. I mean, they've taxed people so much that they have a net outflow of businesses and people. If you want to look at somebody, look at, look at Tennessee and Texas and Utah for the, the state that we want to be. And we would love to um, copy some of the things they're doing and have already, frankly. Senate Bill 1 came from... Uh, last year came from the state of Tennessee. So, yeah, I mean, we understand uh, we don't have an ad budget like the state of New York, uh, so we're attacking it in, in various other ways. But um, I think what we've been more in terms of getting our house in order, internally focused, getting our tax structures right, uh, getting our business climate right, and uh, frankly, uh, we're starting to see the benefits from that. I would say the big swing on that part of it is the equipment inventory tax for the manufacturers. Um, so if you, even our businesses are already here, rather than just attracting ones, right now we, we tax you more if you invest in West Virginia, right? So, and that's kind of what you're talking about. New York's went after, they're going to say we're going to tax you less if you invest in New York. Well, we're one of the very few states left in the country that have a tax both on equipment and inventory for manufacturers. So when they decide to invest in West Virginia, we penalize them with a tax. If we want to grow that industry, which then helps grow all those vendors that are around manufacturing, then we have to become more competitive, and I think that's probably one of the least competitive areas we have, and that's a, that's a big swing because it requires a constitutional amendment. So I think that's, that's probably a um, better suit for West Virginia than an outright eliminating a property tax for 10 years. Um, Beth Sargent, uh, editor of the 
uh, Point Pleasant Register couldn't be here, but she uh, did forward some questions. And uh, I'll direct this, I guess, to all, but I'll start with Secretary Gaunch. Uh, you have been doing tours around the state and including the Ohio River Valley where the Point Pleasant Register is located, uh, visiting facilities and talking to people. And I'll open this up to all of you because you all talk to your constituents in the counties. What are you hearing? What are they asking for? What are you, on your visits, what are their people telling you that what they need uh, to make their business grow? And is it from the top, is it, I'll let you answer the question. Great question, great question, and, and yes, you're right, I've been touring the state. Uh, my staff calls it a listening tour. I call it a celebration tour. Um, and um, the reason for it really kind of <laughs> piggybacks what the uh, delegate Scaff said recent, uh, just a minute ago. <clears throat> I learned early on that one of the things, I, and there's a young man in this room that told me a story about going into uh, going into um, the department store and they have a kiosk out front that says, uh, sign up for our credit card. And, and you go up and say, well, look, I already have your credit card, but I'd love to have that set of tumblers you're giving away to the new customers. And they say, no, sorry, that's only for new customers. That's how I believe some of our businesses feel in West Virginia who've been here, who've invested here, who've hired West Virginians. And so one of the reasons I've been going around the state is to first tell them thank you for being here, thank you for hiring West Virginians, thank you for the investment you've made in West Virginia. What can we do to help you be more successful? And so that leads to the, to the answer, Don, or to the question Don just asked. And I hear various things. I do hear the in inventory and equipment tax is a hindrance to growth. Uh, I hear about uh, 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 workforce issues, uh, and, and obviously we're addressing those with a lot of collaborative efforts, uh, even down in K through 12 education, our community and technical colleges, our four-year institutions, where we have great relationships, uh, starting to what I call teach to the job. So those questions, I think we're going to see uh, some good results in the near future from those. Um, and those are probably the main two things I hear uh, from businesses as I, as I travel around, the tax structure and uh, the workforce issues. Otherwise, let me tell you what I hear. This is the, so while workforce is an issue, a negative issue for, on, the, on the ledger, it's also a positive. Uh, I've heard dozens of times people say this is the best workforce we have in our company in West Virginia. West Virginia, we have the lowest turnover rate. We have uh, 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 everybody shows up for work. They're clean of drugs, and our productivity is better here in West Virginia, one company told me, than any other North American plant we have. So while it's an issue, uh, the workforce, it's also a, a negative issue. It's also very positive. When West Virginians go to work, they're the best workers in the world. So we hear about uh, those issues, um, and we're addressing those problems. Um, and the other thing we're talking to them about is regionalization of our strategies. And what I try to point out is we cannot have for instance, the same economic development strategy in Mingo, McDowell, uh, Boone, Logan, Wyoming counties that we have in Monongalia, uh, Marion, and Harrison. Those strategies have to be different based on what, what issues we're dealing with in lo those locales. And we're in the process right now of doing that, developing regional specific strategies to help those uh, individual regions grow and prosper. Secretary, if, we, if I can follow on that, I, I find it kind of surprising your, your, your comments about the workforce. The, yeah. This state has the lowest workforce participation rate in the country, and it's not even close. What, what is feeding your perception that we have a terrific workforce here? 
Well, it, it's easier. That's what people tell me. Uh, I could name. Well, do you have access to data, don't you? Oh, we, we, we have the lowest workforce participation rate in the country. There's no question about it. We're at least nine points, about nine and a half points lower than the national average. And that's not a new phenomenon, by the way. It's not something that's just happened in the last five or 10 years. Right. I've looked back 30 and 40 years, and it's, and it's been that way. So those are, to some degree, are what I would call more cultural issues, things that we have to deal with, aging population, folks who've decided not to be part of the workforce for one reason or another, the opi opioid epidemic. Obviously, all those tend to feed that problem. Uh, we have seen half a point or almost a point uh, improvement in that number. We'll take any improvement we get. But obviously, that's one of the negatives that we face. So, so what I'm saying is the workers that we have are the best in the world. We just need more of them. We could gentlemen. gentleman answer. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I did want to let the other gentleman answer the question about what you're hearing on your visits. Yeah, so quickly, amen to, to what uh, Ed just, or Secretary Gons just said. In reference to the workforce participation uh, data that, we, that we've all seen, what I found eye-opening last year was we talked to, last year in particular, we had discussions with businesses from all across the state, and they said exactly what Secretary Gons just said. The people that are working are the best in the world. The, the, the folks that are working in our West Virginia plant work harder, are more committed to their coworkers and to the, to the corporation and to their families than any other place in the world, full stop. But what we found was that there were so many, not so many, but there were critical barriers to entry and more in particular re-entry into the workforce that West Virginians were facing that I think eroded any hope that so many had of going back to work and what resulted was kind of a stay-at-home attitude frankly so we said well why are people sitting at home and not wanting to work that's a tough question to answer unless you got a lot of time and you know a whole lot of steps but what we tried to say so what are the big picture things so <laughs> folks were saying well i can't get back into the workforce because you know i was addicted to drugs 10 years ago i haven't used them in 10 years and you know, my, my, you know, my office, my probation officer will attest to that. I'll drug test. But there were still things in our law that prevented them from reentering the workforce. So we've got an option here. We can either walk away from those people and continue to pay for them, or we can get them back into the workforce where they really want to be. And so when we worked with bills like this expungement bill, some of these second chances bill, we narrowly tailored those circumstances so that, that you know, of course, dangerous criminals and, and certain types of crimes, um, you know, that, that's another story. But we said, you know, if for non certain nonviolent felonies, we're giving people another chance to get back in. I can't tell you the response that we had. I don't know. Doug, you could probably, I mean, that, that bill passed the House 90, 80 something to, I mean, overwhelmingly bipartisan support. So that's one thing. So we need to remove barriers of reentry into the workforce, and I think that's one we're looking for. Another one that we'd like to attack this year, so when we started to dig on why are people not going to work, well, in West Virginia, we don't have, we're a rural state, we, we have few metropolitan areas, so we don't have a, a, a robust public transit system that can, uh, that can function for all parts of the state. And what we really learned is, not only can people not pass the background, they can't get to work because they don't have a driver's license. So now we're working with the DMV to find ways to alleviate the pressure on folks that are making a good faith effort to reenter the workforce and how we can get them to work, how we can get them back into their car. And, and obviously, let me, let me put this disclaimer out here because I don't want to, you know, you guys are typing pretty fast out there. Um, it all needs to be done with the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of West Virginia put first. But there's a way to do it and I think we'll make more progress on that front this year. Okay. Um, Secretary Glantz, you mentioned regionalization of, of economies. Um, I think given West Virginia's size and economies of scale, that probably can't just be limited to north central West Virginia or the northern panhandle or the eastern panhandle. Also incorporate Ohio, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia. 
What examples do you have, if any, of successful uh, ventures with other states, or what, what, what's in the works now? You know, again, in the Ohio Valley right now, we've got a, a PTT Global is building, an or not building, but considering an ethane cracker directly across from Moundsville. Uh, Moundsville would benefit greatly. Is the state prepared for that? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, good, great question, too. Um, when I talk about regionalization, primarily what I was talking about was within the 55 counties mm -hmm. of West Virginia. But what you're saying is, are we, re are we looking regionally uh, with other states? And yes, we are. I mean, we participate in the Tri-State Shale Coalition, for example, and mm -hmm. other ventures like that one, understanding that what's good for Belmont County, Ohio, is also good for the panhandle of West Virginia. And, and we expect, frankly, I expect, uh, without any question, for instance, the cracker in Manaka, Pennsylvania, which is eight or 10 miles from the West Virginia border, West Virginia will benefit dramatically. We already have benefited from having uh, uh, construction workers on that project. And we will have prime, uh, permanent employees at that plant, which will hire, I'm told, 500 people. But the bigger benefit is going to be those downstream industries, and that's what we're really concentrating on. Uh, the Ohio River Valley, the Kanawha River Valley, both of those areas are, I think, prime. Uh, we're trying to get sites. Uh, we've already identified a number of sites, uh, trying to prepare and get an uh, additional number of sites ready because we think West Virginia stands in the next three to ten years to benefit greatly from that plant in Pennsylvania and the proposed one in Ohio. We'd love to have a cracker here. I mean, that would be one of those home runs. Everybody kind of holds their breath. We'd love to have a cracker. I would too, but frankly, if I get a vote, I'll take the downstream industries over top of that if I have to choose. I guess maybe for, for the lawmakers, do you feel current laws are, are fashioned in such a way that make it easy to work with neighboring states to make, uh, again, as we look at projects such as this, should we be partnering more with, with our neighboring states? I think, uh, Delegate Capito, you wrote a letter to Jeff Bezos a couple years back with Amazon's HQ2. You know, West Virginia was never going to be part of that unless it was with Pittsburgh or something around the Eastern Panhandle. Um, you know, are, are current laws fashioned in such a way that make that type of, of partnering pos uh, possible? Well, we, we never know unless we try. So, um, but uh, no, I mean, I think that one of the great things about West Virginia, we all, we all tout this, is our proximity to the vast majority of the population of the United States of America, and, 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 and quite frankly, the East Coast. So, uh, you know, how do we leverage that? I think that's a, that's a wonderful opportunity. I'm, I'm open to any sort of legislation that can uh, help us partner with some of those uh, regional uh, folks, you know, whether it's Pittsburgh, Columbus, whoever that might be. Um, uh, but, but as far as particular and specific legislation that's restrictive uh, in that regard, I can't put my thumb on any unless you can, unless you could. But obviously, we want to make sure that we're a, uh, you know, we're operating in an intrastate form. We want, we want people coming um, intra and inter. We want people coming into West Virginia and going out, and, and the more commerce, the better, frankly. So, I would say one of the biggest opportunities for cooperation with the region is around the Department of Energy's effort federally for the Quad State when you're looking at the energy sector for the eastern part of the United States. And they, that's Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, excuse me, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Uh, there's things there with power grid infrastructure for security purposes that are important to the Department of Energy. Um, and in looking at that, there's financial support that feds can come in to help incentivize growth in certain areas, uh, especially around energy production. One of the things that, that I've found, and you talk about going out and around talking to constituents and businesses that are trying to locate here in West Virginia, aside from the big home run like a cracker and you get down to the smaller businesses around that energy sector, smaller meaning billion dollar investments. Those billion dollar investments require venture capital to get going, um, usually in the round 10 to $20 million to get through the high risk stage of it before you can touch the hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. Our neighboring states are in coalitions where they're in regions for venture capital, like uh, the Great Lakes region, for instance, will have 
Illinois, Ohio, and the states around the Great Lakes that participate in a large venture capital group to bring these people in. West Virginia, our largest venture capital effort right now we have, I believe, is $12 million, which is, has got to be fixed. Because those businesses that we're missing out on, we could, if we got into a regional effort for those type of venture capital uh, efforts, or even if we did better just here in West Virginia, if we can get up to where we have $100 million in capital to go in to do venture capital with to assist, there's a lot of opportunity to bring in a lot of the smaller billion-dollar size operations in that sector. And uh, there's a lot of focus with that with DOE as well. Um, I think it's something we have to tackle here in West Virginia. Thank you very much, and great question. You know, I've always, uh, I've always been fascinated by the fact that, you know, sometimes what we have is we have, we have a lot of our biggest attraction of people to the state is our colleges and our institutions. You think of all the people that come from uh, the Northeast to WVU, for example, or the Eastern Panhandle, and then they want to stay here because they love West Virginia, they love the people, they love living here, they love the outdoors, but they can't always find a job. We need to be creative. We need to draw a circle around, for example, Morgantown, go 30, 40 mile radius. And so maybe there's companies located in Washington, PA or Pennsylvania that if we, if we encourage them to hire our West Virginians, but they stay in West Virginia to spend their money and live and raise their family, but work a half hour away, how can we incentivize them that way on the back end? How can we incentivize those people who choose to live in West Virginia but work 30, 40 miles away by giving them a certain tax incentive to stay in West Virginia? Same with the Eastern Panhandle. And without getting Mr. Phil Cabral all excited, you know, that train that we did over there in the Eastern Panhandle, that's one of the greatest things that we could have done to help move people back and forth into Virginia and Maryland. We need to be creative like that and continue. So we, what people love in the Eastern Panhandle, we have flat land. We have a, a decent cost of living over there. And it's, more, they, it's worth them to drive 45 to 50 minutes to an hour and a half and work in the D.C. and surrounding area where there are jobs. So how can we be creative, keep them in West Virginia to live, to raise their family, keep their kids in our school system, but maybe those jobs are across the border. So how can we incentivize them that way on the back end to keep them in West Virginia, even though they happen to work outside our city? Following up on that delegate staff, uh, in... So around Morgantown, Eastern Panhandle, the economy is far better than what it is down in my neck of the woods on the southern uh, coal fields. So what's your message on economic development to coal mining communities um, in counties like Boone, Wyoming, McDowell? Uh, what's the reality for small towns and rural recesses in a largely rural state to share in any form of economic development. Is it reasonable to expect uh, that deployment of high-speed broadband in such areas, or is that notion just too inefficient and cost prohibitive? A couple things. That's a great question, and I got some personal example, too, for you. Um, there's a different type of workforce in southern West Virginia. People are used to working in the coal mines. People are used to working in the industrial in their hands, getting their hands dirty and, getting, and working in the trades, so to speak. We need that across the state. How can we help those people get retrained and give them the tools they need to work in other areas of the state? For example, I know we need some more pipe fitters helping the natural gas industry. Maybe there's people in the coal industry that, that like getting in there and working with their hands and being, how can we retrain them and help? They can't afford to get retrained. So how can we pay and help them get retrained for the tools they need to be successful? Number two, I'll give you an example personally. There was a lack of window installers HVAC contractors, whatever. Some of my best roofers are displaced coal miners who got retrained and now install roofs for the last five to 10 years. They want to work. They like that type of outdoors work. So we need to help give them to raise their hand. I want to work. I may not have a coal miner or I might not have a coal job, but what do we have that are needs out there and how do we give them that skill set so they don't want to live, they don't want to leave what, southern West Virginia. I have people from Boone County and Logan drive to Kanawha County to work because there are roofs up here that need work. So how can we, maybe they want to stay there and raise their family in Boone and Logan and southern West Virginia, right. but how can we help them and incentivize them and give them those type of, of, of traits they need to be successful? And it might be helping them commute to the north central West Virginia to help out, putting them up an extended stay for a week or so to help. I know truck drivers are in dire need across our state. We need more truck drivers. But maybe someone in McDowell County is a great truck driver, but they, we need that truck driver in Wheeling. How do we help them get up there and then go back and live in McDowell County? Delegate Capital, yeah, just please. briefly as a follow-up, I'm going to go back to my kind of my entrepreneurship 
uh, you know, charge here to everybody. And I think that so often when we, when we think of entrepreneurship and innovation, we think, you know, WVU, Marshall, West Virginia State, you know, our, our, our schools in Wheeling, uh, iPhones, AirPods, you know, you know, whatever, uh, hoverboards. But really, entrepreneurship touches so much more than what we think of like Silicon Valley tech. I mean, you think about the entrepreneurs that we have in the, in the gorge right now that are starting businesses and flourishing down there. The, those are, those are all entrepreneurs right there. So what we need is a network, not only in northern West Virginia and in the eastern panhandle, but we need a network that can support our entrepreneurs in the southern part of the state as well. Because as Doug was just saying, you have folks that might be, they, they, might, have, they might be the best roofers in southern West Virginia, but, they're, but all of a sudden you give them the support they need, the business plan they need, and they can start their own business. That's an entrepreneur. That, those are the people and those are the stories that I want to hear more about that we have the support system in place to support people that are willing to take a risk and to grow their own business. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary or Senator Tart, you want to address the question? Uh, we want to give the reporters in the, on the floor a few chances, but if you, I don't want to cut you off if you want to address that question about Southern West Virginia. About Southern West Virginia. Um, one of the things that is, in the recent discussions I've been in is around, uh, and it's been a discussion a long time in the state, but technologies lag behind is, is coal to uh, fuels, right? So if you go to liquid fuels, and um, the past technology went from coal to gas to liquid and was proved to be too expensive. Well, with natural gas abundance that we have now in those prices, and also with technology that's around the world with direct from coal to diesel uh, without the gasification, it's, there's technology there where coal can reinvent itself a little bit. So I don't think you completely leave coal in southern West Virginia. Um, I think that, that there are, um, I've got a chance to speak to a couple international companies around this who have this technology and mastered it and are very interested in being able to do this in West Virginia. Um, and then part of the challenges we have, and that would help a lot of that, it doesn't fix it. It's just one of the silver buckshot uh, coming back to. Um, but one of the things that, that gets in the way, those are smaller operations that would use West Virginia coal, West Virginia gas, add a product instead of shipping it out of the state that we can turn around and sell. So we add value to it here instead of just shipping it out. Those down, there's a lot of downstream stuff off that as well, other petrochemical products that coal can be a part of that gas technology improving in West Virginia, there can be collaboration there. That's part of it. The other part of it is getting back to what Delegate uh, Capito said, is that there has to be some support for the entrepreneur, and we do not have the strength of the support. It gets back to the venture capital. If you have a venture capital fund, any one investment is probably not, not going to exceed 10% of their portfolio. And if you've got your strongest, your absolute strongest venture capital fund at $12 million, that means that $1.2 is your biggest swing you can take. That's pathetic. We have got to get better at it. And until we can get better at, it, at helping our entrepreneurs take risk, we're going to have a hard time attracting entrepreneurs to take risk. So. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, anything on this? Or? Okay. Uh, if we could, John, would you pull the mic? We uh, Questions from the floor we want to try to give the reporters. Betsy, could you give me a high five at, at uh, 1030 or a moment or two after? Uh, questions from the floor? And Mike, Mike Meyer, our senior, I like to say that, the gray, the gray in the mustache confirms it, our senior editor in the state. First question. Payback can be tough, Don. <laughs> Look for it. Uh, I have a question for Delegate Capito. Earlier you talked about uh, focusing on some key tech proposals uh, in terms of technology and entrepreneurship. You talked about some quote, easy, low-hanging fruit. Give us some examples of some of the proposals, some of the low-hanging fruit that you think the legislature might address this year. So I had a conversation this morning um, that revolved around a structural apparatus that we can put in place similar to, the, similar to what they have in Pennsylvania, which is called the Benjamin Franklin Fund. And in, in, in Pennsylvania, what they do is they have four separate kind of uh, groups that support entrepreneurship and innovation in Pennsylvania. One's in Pittsburgh, one's in Philadelphia, one's in the Lehigh Valley, and I think one's at State College. So it's kind of, it's kind of regional. 
I'd like to set up a similar framework in West Virginia. Now, that's the low-hanging fruit. The, the higher reach is obviously getting the funding we need there to be competitive. But I don't think that there's any problem setting up the network that would be governed by uh, a council, a technology council in West Virginia that would be comprised of not government people, but private industry individuals and entrepreneurs that have had success. Because we all know in West Virginia, we have a lot of success stories in, in the tech space. Now, are those people physically located here? Maybe not, but are, are, did we pay it forward with them and are we seeing and reaping the benefits of, 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 of the place that they call home? Absolutely. You look at John Chambers, you look at Brad Smith, you look at these people that want to want a better West Virginia, especially in this space. So I think if we can put kind of that framework in place, I think that that would be a big, big win for West Virginia. And it would show us the way and a path that we can kind of encourage, like I said, from southern West Virginia and northern West Virginia, east and west, all throughout. So that's one. Two, I'd like to see us take a look perhaps at some tax credits that we might be able to offer to angel investment to bring more dollars into West Virginia. We've tried this in the past. Uh, it, it, uh, I think we took it back off the books, but I'd like to take another look at that. I'd like to look at further funding for our SBIR, STTR match program, which has shown great success everywhere I go. Is, is so excited that West Virginia now has a state matching program in that regard. So I think that's another thing. And I think encouragement and, frankly, collaboration with our higher, uh, our institutions of higher learning to figure out ways where we can lower the burden on the intellectual property that's coming out of our universities, the royalty burdens in, that, that are constricting innovation and constricting commercialization of technological progress. So those are a couple things. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to? Okay, next one. Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to come back to something Secretary Gonch said. Uh, you mentioned teaching to the job uh, in a state full of teachers that have been frustrated for years about teaching to a test. So, uh, number one, what has the reaction been uh, as you're trying to introduce and encourage that concept? But then number two, what, what jobs are you talking about teaching to? What, what, how do you start that at the K through 12 level? Great question, too. Uh, the response has been really good, actually. Uh, I have visited a number of, of our career tech centers in West Virginia. So let me start with those and just give you an example. Um, and they do really a good job. And we've got a bunch of really good career tech centers in West Virginia. We have some terrific community and technical colleges. So I'm going to speak basically to those two. Um, historically, I think the way they've decided on what their course offerings were, in some cases, were like, we know so-and-so down the road is a welder, a good welder. He just retired. He still has energy. So let's offer a welding class. And that's been fine, and we've trained some really good welders. But now my encouragement to those folks are let's look down the road five years and decide what are going to be the jobs that these young people have to compete for. And let's start building those programs in career tech and our community and technical colleges to match what we see the jobs developing over the next five to ten years. And we're really starting to see it. I, I was in Lincoln County at their career uh, tech center. And I recall there were 10 young women uh, who were all in some pre-nursing program. All of them were getting ready to graduate from high school and they all either had jobs or they were going on to advance in, the, in a nursing career. So that's kind of the framework that I'm talking about. Uh, we are down to our final few minutes, so I'm going to uh take, I guess, moderator privilege, and I'll ask one more, um, and it open up to anybody. You've all, one of the things we've heard is there are limited resources in West Virginia. We can't compete if it's on a dollar-per-dollar dollar basis. And we've also heard that certain parts of the state are perhaps more prepared than others. How, do, how does the legislature or the Commerce Department, I don't like to use the term pick winners, but how do you pick... I, do, do you have to, based on our resources, target areas that you think success will be greater? Is there a process for that? Is that a consideration? Well, I'll just speak very quickly. I can tell you what we're doing. Uh, first of all, let me say it hadn't been mentioned, uh, but when I read about uh, a Speaker uh, Hanshaw's uh, proposal to 
uh, to have a uh, economical impact fund, I think that's what I heard him call it, a sovereign wealth fund, whatever, that really kind of gets the juices flowing in commerce. That's one of the huge needs that we have. Uh, it, it speaks to what Senator Tarr has been talking about this, this morning. Um, so we, if, if we can develop that venture capital fund to make that available, it will, it will be a huge step forward. I'll, I'll go to Delegate Scaff on that same question. Um, how, do we, how do we decide, how does the legislature decide where to use its resources or target its resources in terms of economic development? Is well, the same thing. I think we just need to be, uh, we need to be accountable, uh, hold the companies and those people that we've already um, put on the books to give incentives and see if they're accountable in doing what they say they're going to do. And if those things work, let's continue to do it. If they don't work, let's scale back and let's change how we've done things. For example, are they creating the jobs that that tax incentive uh, should, should have done? And then we look at the areas of the state that, that have a demand. I mean, Southern West Virginia, like I just spoke about earlier, you know, how do we help Southern West Virginia? That type of help to them might look different than the help and support we give to the Eastern Panhandle. It, it might look at uh, helping them get the trades they need on the Eastern Panhandle, or I'm sorry, Southern West Virginia. Eastern Panhandle might be a whole different help and support, like site readiness. Senator? You know, for any effort that you look at, there's a, um, aside from just the financial expense of the state, there's also an energy expense of the state. So for 60 days in a legislative session, and you're going to pick an effort. And so I don't think you can go through and say you, you don't pick winners and losers because sometimes the legislative process takes a flavor that starts to pick the winner or loser itself. You know, so um, a certain topic can kill several bills because it consumes all the time, for instance. So I, I think that that's um, one of the challenges that we have just with our, the nature of our citizen legislature. Second, I think that you have to look at, because those resources are also limited, of where you can expend energy, is you have to look at the ROI on your effort. So if you're going to take the time, not just your money, to be able to spend to get something that actually is going to have an impact on the lives of mountaineers, then I think that we have to look at stuff that gives the biggest return of job and income growth and liberty for our citizens that we can do. So, and I think that part of that big thing now is we have to look at is are the biggest thing that sits in front of us as an opportunity is that we sit on one of the largest gas wells in the world. So downstream petrochemicals, so it's, it almost puts itself up there and picks itself because you only got so many resources to spend. Very good. And Doug Moore, to the same question in terms of the different needs in the areas and the limited resources, what's your process? Yeah, so I think the big, you know, the big overarching boogeyman in the room is that when you put uh, money towards or effort towards economic development is that we're going to have, you know, a router gate again. So it doesn't necessarily mean that these have to be earmarked dollars to a certain entity. But what investment in, uh, in, 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 in areas can mean is providing services. So is that how do we bolster already in place entities to provide services to anybody that comes in? And encouraging and, and raising awareness to West Virginians of the services that are available. So I don't really see it as picking winners and losers. I think we automatically jump to the conclusion that it's investment in this or investment in that, but really it's an investment in the future, it's an investment in the services, and it's an investment in how we choose to look at West Virginia going forward, quite frankly. Great. Thank you. I want to point out the number of people in the back of the room. Uh, they are not all reporters. In fact, most are either with associations or with development groups or economic development interest, and we thank you for being here, and I think it's important that not only our reporters do their job, but that these folks come down and appreciate your time for being here. And then I can't get away without saying, uh, Mr. Secretary, and any of you, when you're visiting around the state, there are newspapers in all 55 counties, and we would welcome you to come. Uh, they've figured out ways to be successful across West Virginia in different markets, and uh, we welcome you to come in and see the operations. I was just in Roan County Monday and saw their operation with the press and the work they're doing. And there are white-collar jobs in, in every county in the state. So we support the broadband development, and we appreciate the work you're doing to improve the communities uh, all around the state. It's helpful for us. And with that, can I have a round of applause for our panel, please?
Is it possible for me to ask just one question? I just have oh, I'm one. Sorry, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm Martin Staunton with WVBA. I've heard all this talk about the need for investment, but what I want to ask about is I thought there was an $84 billion promise of Chinese investment, and my question is what's the status of that um, promise of an investment, and how many dollars have actually flowed into West Virginia since that promise was made almost two years ago, and is there any hope that that money is going to flow into West Virginia this year? I apologize, Mark. I thought you were giving me a time signal. I didn't realize you were asking for the question. Uh, Secretary Gaunch? Martin, right? Yes. Martin, yes. yes. Uh, good question. I'm glad somebody asked it, actually. Um, first of all, I don't know that there was ever a promise made. It made headlines, sir. Yeah, it definitely made headlines. And I think probably that's the reason that it was done. I'll tell you it was done backwards. It was done uh, just over two years ago. Um, and an MOU was signed which is very general in nature, that, that says that the Chinese <laughs> might spend up to $84 billion if, if, if. Uh, we have a non-disclosure agreement, part of that. Uh, actually, was done, obviously, before my time. Normally, when you have uh, something like that, what you have is due diligence done. Um, uh, you have site work that's being done, searching for this that and the other. In this case, they announced this before any of that ever happened. Normally, you would be two years into a project before you would hear about it. Don't ask me why it was announced, you know, two years ago. I have no clue, wasn't part of it, but I can tell you it was backwards. Normally, you would have all that due diligence done. But since then, I can tell you the due diligence has been done. They've spent considerable dollars here uh, researching uh, looking for sites, talking to engineering firms, et cetera. Uh, is there an, a project imminent? I, couldn't, I, I can't tell you that. I can't say there's a project announcement imminent. But I can tell you that we're closer to it today than we were the day it was announced. Any, any idea on a ballpark dollar amount in that terms of that research and those things that they've actually spent? I, I have an idea, but because of the non-disclosure agreement, I just simply can't tell you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Everyone, we'll have a short break, and we'll resume with our second panel. I see Senator Blair's here, and uh, we'll see the rest of our panelists. Thank you, everyone.